Check one, two, check one, two, test, test, test. Hey, everybody, welcome to uh, Friends of Fearless Ears. This is my weekly live stream where we're just going to practice some ear training together. If you're on the beginner spectrum for ear training, a very warm welcome. We will practice some things that will give you some confidence. And if you are on the advanced spectrum, please join us as well. We are um, very happy that um, you're joining us. I'm just so, seeing, can somebody let me know if I'm live? Live, one, two, one, two, one, two. Let me know if I'm live, everybody. Okay, I think I am. Okay, so if you are on the advanced spectrum, I was gonna say then please hang around as well because I like to make um, connections with sounds that um, help that sort of you can interpret emotionally. That's something that's often new to people and very interesting. I also make interesting connections to music theory. Also, if you are used to, you know, using those little ear training apps and you're faithfully doing those, you know, this is a major third, this is a minor third, this is a first inversion, this is a, a, a triad, what have you. And you are just saying, you're coming to me and saying, you know, I'm doing all these exercises, but it still just doesn't connect. You know, then I have a lot of compassion for you. I will say, keep doing those exercises but I can also help you bridge the gap with some of the exercises that I like to do in my ear training regimens. I have a course out that is a course on ear training. I can show you here where you can find out more about it. It is arisbaseblock.com ear training course. And all those goofy dots after that mean nothing. Um, but uh, we, we um, are having a very big, deep course out about ear training for bass players so that you can be confident in your own ears and don't need to rely on sketchy tab or, you know, Cordify, whatever these things are called. Sometimes my students bring me these things and I go, gosh, you know, it's such a better way if you train your ears. So we're gonna be practicing together a little bit. Grab your base. This is gonna be interactive. And um, I would like to, uh, yeah, just want you to, to participate a lot, please, in the comments. And I'll be asking you questions and you will answer them, hopefully <laughs> get them right. Okay, let's start with um, sound classes. That's always the, the warm up that I like to do when people come to me and they feel like really lost in terms of how sounds connect, where the bass is in the mix, how they can help themselves hear um, how the bass moves to transcribe the songs for themselves. Um, and then uh, I always begin with sound classes. It's a great warm up. I, came up with this. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit crude, but it's extremely helpful. I make the distinction between three main sound classes. There's a fourth one, but we'll, we'll focus on just three for now. My three main sound classes are um, rough sounding, disconnect, dis, um, discordant, um, tension, if you will. This is a tense sound. This is a tense sound. This is a tense sound. And here's one more. There are four of them. Some are further apart. Some are closer together, further apart, closer together. But those are tense sounds. When you watch a movie and the murder is about to come around the corner, tense. For those you know theory, those were seconds and sevenths. They're inversions of each other. They are related. That's why they have the same sound class. Contrast that with sweet sounding, romantic, love song stuff, thirds, major and minor, as well as sixes, major and minor. So th that's the love song stuff. That's the sweet sounds, okay? And then we have another sound class that you could call open or bland, if you will, but people laugh at me because they go, power chords not sounding bland, right? It's powerful, it's open, it doesn't have much information. Those are octaves and fifths, so octaves, and fifths, right, octaves, fifths. can you hear that? And also fourths, fourths rub a little bit because they are wanting to resolve. They wanna resolve here. But I still um, uh, count them as the open sound class or inversions of the fifth, so they belong together. Okay, here's my quiz for you. Open, sweet, or tense. Now here's what I like to do. I'm gonna give you two back to back because you learn very well through contrast. If I just give you one in isolation, I'm like, oh, I'm not so sure, but I'm gonna give you two, and then you get to answer into the chat, please. Um, somebody let me know if Facebook is working, please. Thanks for the for the check-in from YouTube. Um, put into the chat, uh, it's either like, 
you know, the order. So either uh, open and tense or sweet and tense. So again, the three sound classes are open, sweet, and tense. Okay. And you get, I'm going to play two and you got to tell me which ones I'm playing. What is this? And then this. First one. And what's the second one? So you would put two words in the chat. I know there's some delay, so I'm going to help you out. It's open and tense. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Facebook's on as well. Good. Thank you very much. So open and tense was this order. Okay. How about these two? Lots of you guys got it. Well done. How about these two? Here's the first one. Put two words. And number two. Versus. I'll help you out. I know the delay will, they will probably come. Yep, sweet tense. There you go, Colin. Well done. Um, sweet and then tense. So when you hear them back to back, we're often much, it's much easier to uh, identify what's happening rather than when you hear just one in isolation. And what I did here also is I moved the root around, you know, when you are in the very beginning, just trying to figure things out, keep the root the same. And I recommend you get with a buddy and just, you know, quiz yourself 10 minutes of that every day your ears will be much more in tune and you will also start hearing movie soundtracks differently you know music is such an unconscious part of our experience when we're watching a movie so it is a very um uh, it's, it's interesting to tune yourself in what why is the choice of music where is it going you know and these three sound classes for sure um, will uh, will uh, open up a, a way at least to communicate it, you know, if, to yourself um, and to make clear what is happening. So cool, cool, cool. That was a little warm up using sound classes. Again, I'll repeat them. Uh, open, fifths and octaves and also fourths, okay? I got to be honest, I, I played the inversion because it sounds a little more open, but the fourth is also an open sound class, so fourths. And uh, then we have the sweet sound class, thirds, major and minor, and sixes, major and minor. And then we got the tens ones, major second, minor second, flat seven, and major seven, okay? One thing I'll briefly mention is that if you mix other sounds into those sounds, you can create, you can you can change the sound quality. So let's say for this major seven, for example, major seven, if I now add the major third and the fifth in, I'm going to get a chord. Theory people, let me know what that chord is. It consists of a major third, a perfect fifth, and a major seven. And as you can hear, this is a very sweet sound, right? It's it's a bit, it has still, if I isolate the tension, that's definitely tense, right? But as soon as I add the third in, I don't even play the fifth right now. As soon as I add the third in, there's already a sweetness that wasn't there before, right? So now I'm adding the fifth in as well. And I want you to hear the fifth doesn't add much information. It's an open sound class, right? This sound, this is with the fifth. This is without the fifth. It just makes it a little fatter. You hear that? No fifth? With the fifth. It's just a little bit more beef there. But other than that, it doesn't add new information like, for example, this would. Right? And somebody still owes me the name of this chord. It's a major triad on the bottom and a major seven on top. It's very frequently used in jazz. By the way, my coffee here, my favorite cup. Mm, so this is a major seven chord, what I was just alluding to. It's a major seven chord often used in jazz. You've heard 
this before, right? That's a 251 resolution. I'm talking about core progressions, that's a whole other topic for ear training. I will go in this series, I will go in and out of different topics and just use this time to practice a little bit because I just love uh, showing you the applications of things, you know, that's, and I want, I want you there with me practicing. Somebody said E major seven. Yep. You got, there was an E in it. It's a, it was a C major seven and an E major seven would sound like this, but I wasn't even asking you to identify the root. So that would be a, somebody who has perfect pitch who would, who would hear the, uh, exactly what key is it is. I was just fishing for major seven. So you got it. Can't see your guys' name. I think you have to put it in on Facebook. Um, okay, so then the next thing I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about today is um, let's put on a background track. And as you all know, I love using transcribe as a way to um, uh, to figure out um, where... Uh, you know, when I transcribe songs, it's such a great tool to just find, um, you know, your uh, where you are. You can isolate things. You can, um, you can. Let me see here. I'll get this open here. Uh, you can isolate things. You can zoom in. You can change the octaves, which often is very helpful if the bass, for example, is super muddy. And um, there are just great ways of helping you with the visuals you know otherwise when you go on youtube and you're trying to find this exact spot it's just cumbersome to find it and with transcribe you can zoom in and all that good stuff now i need to just figure out where's the screen share the screen share the top screen yes screen two are you screen two i think so um i believe you can now see my transcribe is that right yes but that's the wrong track so i'm gonna pull up um gonna pull up let's see i'm looking for a one okay should we make it major or minor folks i'm gonna do minor all right so here's just a one chord groove in minor and you can see it playing here can you all hear that when you give me an okay if that came through please i'm gonna zoom out so i can see the entire track i do that by doing this And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a groove to that. And the goal for you guys will be to tell me how you can find, um, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, how you can find the, uh, the, the base in it and what I'm doing. Okay, so there are, again, different ways how I'd like you to think about it. If I want, would say one of the biggest mistakes that people may be making in the beginning when they are trying to figure out a baseline is that they're trying to do too much at once and they are fixated on getting every single note right, okay? I'd like to invite you to take a little bit of a bird's eye view, just dial, scale back just a little bit and let's see if you can get the gist of my baseline. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play... To this track, I believe this is. So what I'm demonstrating here, obviously, is I'm playing the root, and I want you to dial in. When you hear the root, it sounds stable. I, it sounds heavy. You can hear there's a pull towards that E, right? And now I'm going to play not the roots. I'm going to hide my fretboard. Can somebody hear what note I'm playing now? I'm not playing the root. I'm going to play both of them actually in a groove now, and then you can tell me if you hear that. So I'm going to help you out. I'm playing the root and the fifth. Okay, I'm playing E to B. Now you could hear that the B didn't have the same heaviness as the root. Fifth, yep, Colin's got it. Um, didn't have the same heaviness as the root, but it still didn't sound like a different information. So we still have a little bit of that um, 
kind of bland sound in there, right? It's part of the chord is what I'm trying to say. So there's no not much new information, but it doesn't sound very stable either. It kind of sounds a little bit like it's floating. Now I'm going to give you another chord, another note. Let's see. So now the word I'd be looking for, which I'm sure will show up in, in the, after the delay in a second, is um, the second. So I was playing a major second. I was playing F sharp. Now that creates a little bit of a tension. That creates a little bit of a sus feel. It creates a little bit of, a, of an unsettling uh, feeling. Now, can you use it in a groove? Absolutely, as long as you're aware of the effect you're getting. So here's what I'm going to do. So far, I have played the root, the second, and the fifth. Okay, I'm going to make a groove out of that. And I want you guys to uh, tell me in which order I'm playing the notes. So every time the bar comes around, I'm going to start over and it's either going to be one, five, two, five, one, two, five, five, whatever. I don't know yet. I can't tell you, but here it comes. So it's just going to be one, two and five. And I'd love to see the numbers in the right order from you. Rub my fretboard up a little bit there in the end. I don't know if it's too small. Yep, well done, Ben. One, two, five. That was exactly it. Um, I'm going to um, do another variation. So that was a lot of notes, but one, one. One, five, two, five, five, two, five, one. Well done, Mark. Yes, that's exactly it. So when I'm hearing the second in the mix, it does bother me a little bit because it doesn't really resolve and it does create a lot of tension. So there's one small change that I can make to make that sound really inside the chord. And that obviously would be going from the second to the third. Why do I say obviously? Because I'm playing with a chord here and the chord has the third in it. A chord is usually root third, fifth of some kind, right? And somebody earlier was uh, commenting, actually, I want to pick that up. I literally just started with chords, um, just working on major seven, minor seven, dominant seven, major seven, flat five. Um, it's usually called major seven, sh sharp four, or minor seven, flat five. Um, I don't get your name, sorry, it just says Facebook user. But uh, you, um, you it's typically got major seven, sharp 11, because it's considered a Lydian chord. But this, hearing those chords back to back, you know, building them on your bass, playing arpeggios from the same root over and over is just a wonderful way to get them under your belt. Um, Thank you very much, Shepard, on YouTube for your lovely comment on my book. I'm very happy to hear that. Second one is almost ready. So there will be more info very soon. So uh, now I'm, I promised I was going to change that pesky little second, right? And um, I'm going to change it to the third. And then let's listen to those two back to back, okay? A again, when we hear things in a, in a context, in a musical context, like of a bass line, it's just such a different experience. Wouldn't you agree? Like when you have these little apps, they have their place. They really do. I'm not discouraging the use of, you know, little apps or functional ear trainer. You guys who know me, you know, I love functional ear trainer. Um, but I just uh, really highly recommend that you um, learn stuff in context. Uh, so that that is what we're doing here. We're practicing our fearless ears. using 
the second and the third. And that takes much of that little floaty bit out, right? Now I'm gonna try a couple of other variations where I use that second, use the tension to my advantage, either by resolving it to the third or by, you know, creating a feel. I mean, you create a little bit of a suspension, you know, if that's, listen to the lyrics. If the lyrics are telling you a story that has a bit of a, a suspense factor in it, then that might be a wonderful choice to use at that point, for example. So that's without the second. Now, to be honest, I miss it a little bit. It's too square. There it is. You know, there's another thing I'm doing, especially when I'm going from the F sharp to the B. I am implying a 2 5. Now, for those of you who learn chords or know chords, you know that in jazz, oftentimes, for example, um, we, we don't just have a one chord for a long time, but we have a two, five, and then it leads me to the next chord. That's a, a device that's often done because it colors where I'm going, right? It's sort of like a pointer here. I'm about to go here, two, five to the one, right? And in this case, I was just staying on the same root. So I could go to another chord or I could go to, back to the same, same root. So when I play root, and especially in the end of the bar, it almost sounds like two, five, one, right? It's almost like I'm bringing it back around, two, five, back to the one. So that's, uh, that's an implied chord progression. And does do the people who do the chords play it need to play that too? Actually, no, it kind of works, right? Um, it's just me implying that. And because we have heard it so many times, maybe never consciously, but it's a very, very important uh, chord progression. Let's do one more. I'm gonna play, I'm gonna let you guys guess. I'm gonna use one, two, three, five, and you tell me the order. It's a long one. One, two, three, five, five, three, five. But I love what Ben did. He put the first part in, and that's often my experience. Also, when I when I uh, figure out bass lines, yep, you got it. Five, five, yep. Um, wait. Five, three, five. You almost got it. One, two, three, five, five, three, five, one. Um, so when you when you try to figure this out, it might seem like a lot of notes, you know. So one thing, of course, you can do and transcribe. You can go in and slow it down, which is, you know, then it's much easier. So now I looped it. There was no reason for looping it, but um. That's, you know, always is helpful. And I'm a big proponent of using tools, you know. Um, they can sometimes make us a little lazy and be a little crutch or whatnot, but especially when you're just learning, you know, and, and just really trying to get into the nooks of, of what's happening in a song, it is such a great tool. I mentioned also last time with Transcribe, one thing you can do is you can um, bring the octave up it sounds horrible, but you may actually hear the bass better. So if you're like trying to figure out a Motown bass line or one of those recordings where the bass kind of buried in the mix and really low endy and you bring it up an octave, then all of a sudden it might pop out to you more. So I recommend you play with that, especially if you're doing tunes where you are uh, trying to, um, you know, figure out exactly what the bass is doing. So that can be very helpful. Um, okay, I want to do one more quick thing. And uh, what I want to do is I want to show you how this idea that I was just using one, two, three, five, five, three, five, right? This sort of thing. You can also use that in a chord progression. And let's see. I don't even know what I have up here and in what key I am. I think that's C. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's the one I used last time. Let's not use that one today. I'm just going to see what I got up here. Um, okay, we got a blues up here. Wait a minute. Oh. 
For some reason, it's messing with my windows. Um, and why would I not be able to change the tone? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, well, let's do it with this one. You, I, as far as I hear, you guys don't hear the bass in the track very much anyway, so you'll have the pleasure of hearing two basses now. Uh, but I, I think mine is way louder anyway, so what's the feedback I got last time? So that's why I'm actually playing it rather than getting it from the track. But here is a chord progression, and I'm going to play with my one, two, three, five idea. Okay, but now because we have a chord progression, I'm actually moving through chords, you're going to hear how I'm sort of developing that idea. And that is a nice thing to hear and see. So here the chord progression is the world famous one, five, six, four chord progression. One, five chord, six chord, and the four chord. And so what I'm going to do now, what I do was one, two, three, one, five, five, one, two, three, one, five, five. And I need to change it according to the chord I'm on. So that the second bass and it bothers me a little bit, but um, you can hear I was just using one, two, three, five, right? For example, and I was moving it over the changes. So when I have the C, I got C, D, E, G, right? When I got the G, just move it down, same thing, one, two, three, five, and then. Uh, on the A minor, I have to, I can move up here or I can stay here. One, two, three, five. I have to adjust the third now, though, because it's A minor. So if I play a major, that would not fit. So I have to, to make it fit my key. And then I have F. One, two, three, five. They're right here, right? And that's a nice exercise. Pull a chord, pull a track. Give yourself some numbers, you know, yell in the kitchen, somebody give me some numbers before I'm one and eight, you know, and then they go one, two, five, four, you know, and then you try to make a groove out of that. Here are a couple of tricks. Think of the sound classes. Two adds tension. Seven can add tension uh, if it's not in the chord, but it typically works if you get the right seventh. So uh, that, that little bit of music theory knowledge helps here. I'm going to do, uh, let's say... I'm going to use the seventh in, in this groove. So a one, five, six, four. Here's a question for you. The one chord, what kind of seventh does it have? It's part out of my C major universe, right? All the notes I'm using are out of C major. So I can do the math sort of and figure out what are all, all my sevenths. So the, well, the one chord is going to be a major seven because there is a B in it. The five chord is going to be a dominant seven. That's mixolydian, what I'm playing here. Don't even worry about it. But the most important thing is that there is an F as a seventh chord. So it is a dominant seven, also called G7 uh, for our friend here who said earlier, practicing the chords. So there you go, right in line with that. And then we have the A minor. Well, what's, I'm still playing C major. I'm just starting it on A, right? So the seven here would be a G. So it's an A minor seven chord, A minor seven. And then we have the F, which gives you that beautiful um, sharp 11 sound. Again, for the person who was mentioning the chords earlier, it's is an F major sharp 11 if you that sharp 11 in there so that's a kind of chord that sounds like this right where it's um ah, i'm running out of fingers um but uh you have the you have the b in there not the b flat if you were in f key of f you would have a b flat we're in the key of f lydian so it is just a regular b and that gives you this beautiful sharp 11 sound you know um, that's what that is. So uh, th th that's all just staying inside the key of C. And I'm going to, as promised, use one, two, three, five, seven. 
Let's see if I can make something out of that. No idea. Shall see. Ah. A lot of notes to fit in there. I'll just play the triads so you can hear it. So the chord doesn't, if I hear it right, doesn't play the, the seven at all. So I'm adding it, right? But because I know what I'm doing, it fits, right? So the, the track is built mostly on triads, and I am adding that seventh in, but because it's a fitting seven, I'm okay. I'm going to make a mistake now so you can hear it. Again, contrast. I love working with contrast. I'm going to play all the wrong sevens. One, three, five, and then the wrong seven. Listen to what this sounds like. Here we go. Sort of works, but... Ah. No. That one works maybe the best. Some of these sevens I had to make minor to make them quote unquote wrong. And I hope you heard that. I hope you heard that. I just sounded, all of those sounded outside, right? So contrast, that's one principle I'd like to uh, put close to your heart when you're practicing your ears, work with contrast. One great contrast is inside and outside. When I played the chords as they are part of the chord, Those are all the diatonic chords. They are all very much inside, right? But when I add notes that are not part of it, then you can definitely hear it as, as sticking out. So that, that can be helpful. All right, everybody, I'm going to wrap it up. This was our Friday live ear stream. Get fearless ears. And if you would like to know more about this program that I was using here, you can see my... Um, my uh, uh, my links here down here. And if you are interested in my ear training course, this is a very deep, very big course that uh, we are offering all on ear training, especially for the bass player, where I go through six different paths that are my favorite ways of practicing my ears. And um, theory is one of them. Functional ear training is another using your voice. So there are several paths that I go through and um, it's a very deep course. So if you're interested in that, the info is right here. Okay, everybody, I wish you all a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for joining me. Please come back next week for our fearless ears. Cheers. <laughs>